Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to episode six of the Rings of Power. The... Uh, what, what kind of reality have we arrived at at this point? I feel like we've finally come to the point where so many of the plot points that have appeared have begun to, like, hit some sort of an advancing point, and I have no idea how we really got here. Like, Numenor dude's daughter is like, Papa, I tried to help you. It's like, who are you? Oh, I'm the one who flirted with that blonde guy, like, 17 episodes ago. Oh, you're evil now? Yeah. Oh, huh. shit. Yeah, I forgot she existed until she was like, evil elf balls bad. And the whole thing with the Pharos the so they're going to condemn Numenor dude because he was a, meanie, a mean grumpy puss in last episode, and they're going to condemn him to a judgment by the Valar. Now, that makes sort of kind of sense, because you're thinking like, okay, these people are rejecting the Valar, but here's the thing, they know the Valar are real, right? Like, they know this guy is on the side of the Valar. This is like... <laughs> You know God is an actual, real, observable entity. You've probably seen God at some point, right? And now you're going to take a guy who you know is on God's side, and you're going to leave his judgment to God, and then you're shocked, like, wait, God, you forgave him? Like, yeah, he's on my team, what the fuck? Uh, it, it's like, everything about this episode was either, oh, Right, yeah, that character exists, or painfully predictable. It's one of those episodes where you can tell that the screenwriters have seen this in other pieces of media, and they're like, oh, that's cool. Y you know the part where they're like, yo, your fate is up to the gods now, and the hero somehow survives? That's a great scene. Let's do that. And then she survives, because literally in this universe, God is real, and yep, the... Uh, <laughs> it doesn't make any sort of sense from an in-universe standpoint. And the whole, like, Kekakudori of Sauron, too. Out of nowhere now, Galadriel is turning to uh, Anathar and going, like, Don't you see, Anathar? Sauron brought your armies here for a reason. And I was like, that's fucking dumb. Why? He's besieged. He's got nowhere to go. Have you met this fool? He couldn't, he couldn't plot his way out of a goddamn Vank pit half the time. But uh, he probably is. I I don't know, and it's like... It tr trying to make Celebrimbor feel like he is alone and isolated, pushing his own smiths away. Yes, I get it, but also making a point of him forgetting some chick's name when he's completely stressed out about everything, and it's like, yes, I, I forget the most obvious shit when I am overly stressed. Hell, just on a day-to-day -day hourly thing i forget my left or my right so like can't can't help if he's forgetting names of just people he works with well him isolating Celebrimbor. so th there's a scene where Celebrimbor hears the siege alarm because the orcs have arrived outside of a region they're about to besiege him Celebrimbor's like my god what was that i need to run outside and see and anathan tries to stop him but doesn't do it and he finally actually uses some magic for the first time in this entire goddamn show he actually demonstrates a measure of power as Celebrimbor runs out in the middle of the night mind you he's been looking out a window he knows it's night and then he arrives outside it's broad daylight, and he's like, oh, everything's fine. <laughs> Are you brain damaged? What the fuck is wrong with you? I, okay, Th this scene too is the least diverse scene in the entire show. You see a shot, and there's nothing but white people around. Even the horses are white, and like, oh, that's why he thinks nothing is wrong. He's like, oh my god, diversity is gone. Yeah. <laughs> my world is saved. <laughs> Arch was afraid that, oh my god, is is it bad? Where it's it's a perfect world because ev all the elves are white. And then we were safe because we see an Asian and a, and a, and a black child. So it's okay. It's fine. Yep. Balance is restored. Uh, Celebrimbo was about to see through the illusion, but then he spotted the one black child sitting there. He's like, oh, it is Regyon. <laughs> For a moment there, I thought I died and come to paradise <laughs> or something. <laughs> but I, I, I love the idea that they have the preceding shot where he's looking through the window where it's obviously nighttime outside and he arrives to broad daylight and not for a second does he go like, that's weird. 
Oh, uh, because again, the the authors of this goddamn show, they wrote this, but they, they can't think for two goddamn seconds at a time. And so they just have the, the conceptualization of the idea. The conceptualization is, Celebrimbor is about to discover it. All of the people in front of the tel television are going to be like, oh my god, he's going to find it out. And then Sauron uses his powers and he doesn't find out. But the problem is, again, they can't think an inch further as they create a scene where Celebrimbor looks out at the dark night and it's like, oh my god, it's it's bright outside now. And this kind of comes back yeah. to the, um, he, he's stressed, right? And part mm. of that's kind of a nice, nice touch because Anathor is clearly trying to separate him from the rest of his smiths, right? But he's an elf. He doesn't get tired. Like, this is not a part of how elves exist. He doesn't get stressed. He doesn't forget shit. Elves literally have perfect recall at all times. Like, Legolas and Aragorn ran for days after the orcs, and that's just Legolas. This is a way higher elf again than that. It's like, again, they forget the setting they are operating in, and they simply make all of the characters, be they elves or humans or orcs or whatever, into just humans. Yeah, it's... They, they try so hard, but it anything that they're trying to do can't get off the fucking ground. And with the dwarves, it, it they just turn King Durin into a, a Jewish man. Oh, That's yes. about it. Durin puts rings on finger, starts reading Toran. <laughs> Although, oh, even that is is not the greatest insult in this episode. Oh god! So T Tom Bombadil returns as always, and he's actively helping Gandalf. Now this makes him the exact opposite of Tom Bombadil, because Tom Bombadil doesn't give a shit about anything that happens. If the entirety of Middle-earth was to fall to Sauron, it would be like a weed in his garden rotted. Tom Bombadil is so far beyond this, this is the quarrels of ants in his backyard to him, and yet he's helping Gandalf. And then, they do the line, where are the, oh, what was it? Many in this world who deserve death live, and many who deserve life die. The famous line that Gandalf told to Frodo. Well, the authors sweep in and go like, no, that was actually us. <laughs> oh, there is, there is no pit in hell quite deep enough for these fuckers, I swear to Jesus. I mean, I mean, don't forget. Uh, he, he tells not Gandalf that he either needs to follow his destiny and find his magic branch or go help his friends. And I, I'm already predicting right now that he's going to go help his friend Nori in all that. And just be like, oh no, they're in danger. Oh no, we're in mortal danger now. He finds the branch and it's like, ah oh, yes, this is the one I'm looking for. He smacks it against the ground and then everyone's saved. Yeah, because the entire thing here is that he needs to learn the lesson that his friends are more important because that's the only way he can save Middle-earth. And so he's going to look for the staff and go, this is impossible. Then finally he decides to go save the goddamn Harfoots. He's like, oh, there it is. And the fucking, the Harfoots. We now have a Harfoot romance subplot. Thank God. That was what we really needed. That was, that was, that was the thing that was missing to make me finally give a shit about the Harfoots. A romance subplot. Brilliant. Uh, I, I, I already forgot about both of them. The only thing I remember is them holding a venomous snake. Uh, yes. Kissing. And then said, oh, did you eat lizard today? It's like, uh, a little bit. Yeah. Oh, and Numenor man and, uh, uh McQuen is, is also in love now because reasons. <sighs> the goddamn needless romance plots. So, okay. Lord of the Rings is not a romance setting. It has very little romance because it's not about romance. The only romance is really in Lord of the Rings is Aragorn and, uh, Eowyn. Not Eowyn, Arwen. 
users, because their names are so similar, um, because that is kind of the promise of something in the future. It is him protecting a wife and family and the future. And Eowyn has a bit of a crush on him because uh, he's the main character. That's about it. And there is no romance beyond, like, a, a chaste kiss in the entirety of it. Now everyone has a goddamn romance subplot. I half expect Gandalf to find himself a nice boy to romance or something. I mean, don't forget, uh, during the what promote, like the promo tour or whatever, they're like, oh my god, are you ready to ship Galadriel and fucking Sauron? Or do you want to ship uh, Celebrimbor and Sauron or Anatar? It's like, no, no, nobody cares about shipping culture. No, please stop. It's like, I get it. You want teenage girls to watch this stuff and they, them boys. Who cares? Let us have our cool fantasy, please. Yeah, and... Anatar is starting to make bedroom eyes at Galadriel now. I swear Anatar, to you mean You mean Adar? Yeah, Anatar Ad Adar, is... yes. There you go. Too many A's. Oh, too many A's. They're, they're gonna start shipping those two now. It's just, it's not... That it isn't necessary. There, there isn't a good reason for why this should be happening. It takes screen time away from interesting and useful stuff, and particularly at this point as well, where it felt like a lot of this episode was both filler and at the same time, like the last five minutes of exposition to make the rest of the story make sense. Like, there's a scene where Black Elf is on screen for about two minutes and he kills a couple of walks. We don't see his ass again. What the fuck was that about? He had to get his three second Legolas scene. Yeah, that's literally about it. He exists to be Legolas for a handful of seconds because maybe he's contractually allowed to be on screen every episode. Then he disappears and like, oh, what was that about? Oh, I don't know. He was setting something up, I guess. And, oh, the way that... Okay, so one of the things we've kept talking about so often is that I wish we had the Sauron that the characters were actually talking about. Because the characters talk about Sauron as if he's this incredible evil genius who's everywhere at once, doing everywhere thing at once. Meanwhile, he's off someone else bumble-fucking things up and barely keeping it together. But they show uh, Adar bringing forth the crown of Morgoth. And he's like, I use the power of the crow crown to defeat Sauron. And that sounds so cool. It makes it sound like he channeled the crown's power, the spirit of Morgoth, and banished the evil lord. When in reality, what did he do? He stabbed him with it. Like, I stabbed him with the pointy bits. <laughs> like, it's so, it's so unbelievably reductivist. It's like, oh, you, you literally, you, you're writing this. I used the power of Morgoth's crown against him. You could have done something cool about that. Like, a scene where the vampire shirks away from the Holy Cross, like, no, how did you get that? Or something. No, he just, he, 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 he stabs him with the fucking sharp bits. It's so yeah. incredibly, oh. Mm. Uh, and then Galadriel had her woman moment of the episode where she just spills everything to Adar, everything she knows, who's carrying her ring, who's going where, what's happening where, and then he's like, oh, well, thank you. I didn't want to know all of that, but thank you. It told me ever everything I wanted to know and even more. But then she looks so sad afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was the only, like, genuine emotion other than disgruntled that we've ever seen from that woman. And to be fair, it was, she looked really sad. <laughs> As she like, oh. She I'm a retard, aren't I? Yes, my dear, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's, it's Galadriel. She's supposed to be this ancient, super wise elf, and... Literally, Adar talks, like, he doesn't even try. She spills most of this shit without him even trying. And at the end of it, he just looks kind of surprised, like, thank you, you t told me everything I needed. More, actually. Huh. <laughs> uh, I mean, Galadriel's been having a lot of woman moments, but this one was her genuine, defined woman moment. 
uh, it was actually kind of good. She's she's reaching at straws afterwards. It's like, oh, listen, Sauron totally brought you and all of your armies here because he's got a plan or something. And Ada just looks at her like, bitch, you think I'm going to take your word for anything at this point? You have it, not it, demonstrated like any intelligence so far, woman. And it's like the retort that he had was probably like the best thing out of that entire exchange where she's like, oh, don't fall for his lure. And he's like, I'll make him choke on his lure. It's like, yes, okay, that's fine. But come on. That's what is a little cool. Oh, there's another brilliant scene as well, where the, the elves, the, the sharp-eyed elves are standing at their watchtowers, and they're looking horrified, like, oh my god, orcs in the distance. So maybe, maybe they spotted them with their, their keen elf eyes, the orcs moving through the trees miles away. No, the orcs have already moved like half a dozen catapults on the shore, there's fires burning everywhere, they're carrying torches. <laughs> the only thing they're lacking is an enormous sign saying like, hello, we are orcs, come to invade you. <laughs> It's like, I would understand not seeing them right away during the daytime because it's like, you know, they're not very colorful, so they might blend into the trees a bit. No, this is at night, fires a-blazing. What are they, what are they doing playing fucking cards? <sighs> I, again, it's... It's the fact that they don't understand what they're goddamn writing. They're elves. When an elf is on guard patrol, that is a superhuman, okay? That, that is like a a perfect human being with 50 times the eyesight, 50 times the hearings, 50 times the concentration power. Th this, this is a person who should be able to spot a leaf fucking falling half a kilometer away. But because they don't understand any of this, they're just tarded Canadians or Californians standing up there like, oh, that appears to be orcs. And then he calls over his two buddies, like, say, do you see that? Yeah, it looks like an army of orcs. Hmm, best cap get the captain in case we're, you know, misseeing this or something. Third guy arrives. Yep, those are orcs, all right. Should probably ring the alarm or something. The, the best comparison is probably anyone standing guard at the U.S. southern border. Are those a bunch of Mexicans? <laughs> nope. Mm, no, I think that's sand. I don't know. What do you think? Mm, I don't know. Yep, those are Mexicans. Ah, oh, shit, they crossed the river. Yeah, never mind, let them through. Shut up, Ted. Those are clearly Hondurans. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it's so stupid. I, uh, of course, uh, the worst part is, too. Like, we're seeing the orcs finally begin to move their catapults up, and Lom Lom is like, I bet you we, the last scene is going to be a giant ball of fire heading towards a black screen. And yes, that is exactly what happens. Because these writers are so unfathomably formulaic, it actually hurts. It, it's sad that we could probably predict what's going to happen in the season finale. I mean, the the only thing that could make this at least mildly interesting if they keikakudoried the shit out of it, Sauron just like, oh yeah, no, I planned this all along. And then maybe some flashbacks. Again, the big problem is they've, they've personified Sauron. You can't make Sauron a person, because you do, and then you show him on screen, and he's not doing anything. He's barely keeping Celebrimbor on track, at best, and they're attributing all of this mad nonsense to him. Like, oh, he's doing this, and he's doing that, and he's corrupting this person. Like, no, he's not doing any of that shit. In yeah, fact, he's, he's just sitting in Celebrimbor's tower, drinking wine, and be like, Ah, oh, yes, this is this is lovely. Oh, what I do? Oh, yeah, I did that. Because yeah, the problem now is the, the rings are corrupting people again, which they didn't do. These rings don't have any of that power because the one ring hasn't been made yet. Sauron is not asserting any influence over these people. And so it makes no sense for King Durin to suddenly be like, oh, I'm greedy and weird now. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. I can only imagine what the hell they're going to try to do when the One Ring is forged. I mean, I imagine that will be the moment when Durin the, the second overthrows his daddy Durin, basically, and saves the dwarves at the last moment, because the dwarves right now are delving for the Balrog. And there's a beautiful scene as well where the dwarves have been ordered to double the shifts, to dig deeper, dig more greedily. So they bring a bunch of dwarves down there, and Deesa's there... And like, oh, Deesa, please don't do this. We'll have to move you if you don't move. And she just rees at them. And ironically, she actually just rees at them. And this summons a flock 
of bats, which sends all the hardy dwarf miners running because I assume they've never seen a bat before. Uh, it, it's like the the only thing that I could think for what they're probably going to try to do with everyone going crazy for the rings when the one ring is forged is they're probably going to have constant like Bilbo Baggins creepy face bullshit like here I'll set it over they'll probably just try to pull this all the time for anyone who's a ring bearer and again they, they probably will and that too will like misunderstand it because the moment Sauron did that it was already too late. It was already over. The rings were already his to use, in essence. God. <clears throat> but they are, they're probably Wait. given. Oh, also, Celebrimbor Kale, was also given a new load of mithril, which has been ground into a powder, which we never actually saw how he obtained. Like, Anator's like, here, uh, powdered mithril. Somehow. I don't know, maybe he had some put away, uh, some that he corrupted himself, because it is a nice fine powder, who knows what the fuck he added to it. Maybe he jizzed in it a little bit, I don't fucking know. So but it's like... It. <laughs> it, it's... I don't know, it'll be interesting. I mean, if we start picking away at plot holes, we'll be here all day. Like, the, the Palantir can see the future now, which is uh, like, no, no. They don't do that. They're literally just... They're remarkably effective magnifying glasses. That's what the Palantir are. They can communicate to a certain degree and they can magnify things. That's about it. They're seeing stones. They're not oracles or anything, and people are using them as that now. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. And it's like... It's not even just showing the future like it did with the other episodes where it showed, like, Numenor flooding and everything. But it showed fucking evil eyebrow man, like, um, Sauron as, what's his face? I already forgot his name. Um, whatever. And it showed Mount Doom and the ball of fire that would be the Eye of Sauron. Why is he seeing this? Which is also interesting, because if he's seeing the Eye of Sauron, that means he's seeing uh, Sauron after his defeat. I feel like Sauron might be interested in that piece of information. Like, what? <laughs> I get killed? Yeah. Well, oh, shit. It's a bit of a bit of a hiccup in my plan right there. <laughs> oh, we got we got two more episodes of Torment to go through, and I'm sure and three more we'll probably seasons. have a, we we will have one interesting episode of fighting, or maybe half an episode of fighting, with some hardfoots mixed in. And then we'll probably get a subpar season finale. Yeah, because the Harfoots too are now deciding, like, yeah, let's fight the evil wizard. And the worst part, we haven't actually seen what the evil wizard has done yet either. Like, the, the Harfoots are actually like, oh, turn over your uh, other Harfoots, because they're here illegally or something. They're illegal immigrants. And the Harfoots are like, no, we won't do that. Why? Because uh, we like him. It says so in the script. Oh, okay, fine. I mean, the only the the only thing that he's done so far is summon Feminem twice. Yeah, no, the the again, the evil wizard has done unironically nothing wrong. We don't even know why is he the dark wizard. What he he makes his dudes wear bronze masks in the deserts. I mean, that's a little bit asshole. Yes, I imagine that gets hot, but is that his worst crime? Hmm. I, again, it's one of those things where I, I think they're they're looking at Lord of the Rings and they're thinking like, okay, uh, Lord of the Rings just states a lot of things. Like, Sauron is powerful and dark, therefore he is evil. And they're like, oh, so we can just like say that the Dark Wizard is like dark and like people will accept that? Yes, if you can do it effectively enough. Like, if you can build enough mystery around something, you can do that. The problem is, there's no mystery around the Dark Wizard because there isn't any information about the Dark Wizard. All he knows is that he lives in a sand house and he has servants with weird masks. That's about the extent of our information about the mask, well, about the Dark Wizard. I don't know. It's like, I think the dudes who are wearing the masks are like sick with something like lepers because they're like, hey, if we do this for you, will you 
cheer us or whatever the fuck the deal was. And he was like, yeah, sure, whatever. Or just slaves to the dark gods. Like, there's there's another thing in um in in two towers, I believe, where they're carrying out an ambush against a patrol patrol of Haradrim. And there's a scene where Faramir looks down at one of the slain Haradrim and go like, didn't this man as well? Did, like, why did he come here? Wouldn't he have liked to stay at home? What was his story? Was he truly evil, or was he forced to join up in the Dark Lord's armies? Like. That would actually be an interesting story. Put 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 that story on screen. The Haradrim's point of view. How are they being affected by Sauron? Are they actually corrupted? Are they forced to fight? How are they forced to fight? Did they try to resist? It would be a wonderfully melancholic end to a character's journey to die there and have Faramir look down upon you and realize that in the eyes of Middle-earth, in the eyes of Faramir, Frodo, and all the heroes, this was a villain, even though we've seen that he was just a man living in a dark time. But no, we, we don't have that. We, we can't have that. We just have that guy bad. How do you know? His name is Dark. Yeah. <sighs> I don't know. It's like, as always, my expectations are low, so it shouldn't take it shouldn't take too much work to you know at least jump over that bar. But so far, Payne and McKay have been subpar at best. Subpar in every way. Like, just they're amateurs playing at the big leagues. I mean. Even the design of the characters, so we get to see more of Farazon in this episode, and I love, I love the way that they've styled his eyebrows to look like little horns. You know there's a makeup director there with a tiny brush that just keeps brushing his eyebrows like, no, pointier, <laughs> pointier. <laughs> that is literally the best part of all, all the costumes. That... <laughs> Just his little pointy eyebrows. Little pointy eyebrows. And again, it's because he hasn't actually done anything wrong yet. Like, well, like, he's a bit oppressive. Like, oh, he's, he's securing his rule. All right. I mean, terrible, I guess. But he genuinely believes he's been chosen by the eagle. In fact, that might even be a part of the explanation for why he tries to sacrifice Numenor Man to the, the Valar, because he thinks he might actually have the Valars on his side. The dude is doing diddly dick nothing particularly wrong, but he is evil because we know that the other side is good. He is defined not as evil by his actions, but by his opposition to the people that the script has declared to be good. Fuck. It's such awful storytelling. It'll only go worse from here, Arch.